Okay, today's Tuesday, March 1st, and in this Ukraine explainer, I'm going to try to uh, say a little bit about China's position on this. Why has China uh, uh, adopted the position it has, and, and what are the implications for Chinese-Russia relations going forward? Uh, and also address a question a lot of my students have been asking, um, which is, how do we know what we're, that the information we're getting on this uh, conflict is reliable and how do we how do we get reliable information um, but first maybe I'll just say a little bit on on what's been going on in the last day or two um, in a way from the outside I think uh, it's been a little bit of of the calm before the storm yesterday and today although I think if you've been in Kiev or, or Kharkiv in Ukraine it's not been calm at all um, but essentially the the Russian advance having been somewhat stalled uh, after its initial push into Ukraine, has spent the last couple of days uh, um, preparing, especially this long column of of, uh, of armored vehicles and 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 um, artillery outside of Kiev. Um, essentially, what Russia appears to be doing is getting ready to start um, essentially just shelling major Ukrainian cities. And so the tactics have now changed. Rather than bringing in a massive show of force and assuming that the Ukrainians were going to crumble in front of it, um, they're now taking a more traditional tack that says uh, you don't want to do tank warfare in the middle of cities, so before you send the tanks in, you just uh, uh, sort of try to empty the place out with artillery. And anyone who wants to see what that looks like can go on Google or your favorite search engine and look at pictures of Grozny, uh, which was the capital of Chechnya, which uh, where Russia used these tactics in 1999, really when Putin first became prime minister. Uh, it's a it's a pretty brutal scenario in which, uh, you know, basically the whole city got leveled and depopulated as a way of making it easier for Russia to conquer. Hopefully that's uh, that's not what's coming, but it's but it's certainly what it looks like. Um, so moving on to these two issues I want to talk about today. Um, a lot of people have asked me about China and its relations with Russia. Are they allies? Are they going to be allies? Why did Russia abstain in its vote at the UN Security Council? And I will try to explain this, though, to be clear, I'm more of an expert on Russia and Ukraine than I am on, on China. But I've looked at, uh, at, at China-Russia's relations, especially in connection with the course I teach. Um, China's trying to uh, hew to a middle course politically, which is to say, I think the Chinese share... Russia's sense of grievance against the United States and against the West, trying to export uh, democracy, uh, trying to tell other countries how they should run things. Um, the United States sense, at least in the eyes of the Russians and the Chinese, that, that the United States should be the dominant country in the world. Uh, Russia and China uh, both uh, do not like that idea, and so they share this opposition to some of the American and Western assumptions about the world. Um, but at the same time, while they share those oppositions, they don't necessarily have a perfect overlap in their missions. And in particular, what I would stress is Russia is trying to turn back the clock to 1991 or maybe 1914, if we believe Putin's speech last week. China is, is quite the opposite. China sees the future as, as belonging to China. And so rather than looking backwards, China just wants to let the clock roll forward to a point where it's more powerful than it is now and can do more of what it wants uh, than it is now. So China in particular is willing to be much more patient than Russia is because it doesn't see things slipping away. It sees things evolving to its advantage. Um, in particular, China doesn't want to see anything happen that disrupts that, disrupts its economic growth, um, and disrupts what it sees as a, a world situation that's that's changing um, in its way. So in particular then, China, without alienating Russia by coming out against the invasion, um, also doesn't want to unnecessarily alienate the United States or Europe or the West of global opinion by coming out in favor of it. So uh, the Chinese ambassador, when he made his speech prior to his... Um, um, abstention from the vote uh, condemning China in the Security Council last week, he gave a long speech in which he was very critical of the United States um, and really blamed the United States for the situation Russia finds itself in, but then said that the, that the conflict should be settled through negotiations. And, uh, and that, uh, it seems, continues to be China's plan, and I think China will be consistent in that. In order to benefit from this crisis, China doesn't need to do anything. All it needs to do is sit, 
watch Russia get more isolated from the West, um, and and that defi- by definition then will make Russia more dependent on China. So any future negotiations of whether we call it an alliance or a partnership or just a marriage of convenience between Russia and China is going to have to be more and more on uh, Chinese terms because Russia now has fewer uh, alternatives than ever before. Um, so, for example, we're thinking about uh, uh, things like uh, building pipelines to to pipe Russian gas to China. So, it, so Ch- uh, Russia has an alternative market. China has an alternative supply. The negotiations over that will now be, you know, skewed a little bit more in China's direction. So I don't think we're going to see China do anything uh, dramatic other than what it's done. It will criticize the United States. It will criticize the West. But it's not going to endorse uh, China. Uh, I'm sorry. It's not going to endorse Russia invading another country. Has nothing uh, to gain from that. Doesn't need to do it. Um, so I'm going to switch now topics to, to a, a topic that especially a lot of my students have asked me. Um, which is how do you find reliable information about the war or how do you know that the information you're, you're getting is reliable? And first, I, I have to begin by quoting two old sayings. Um, one is that uh, in war, the first casualty is truth. And the other is one that's um, sometimes attributed to Mark Twain, sometimes attributed to other people, and that gives you an idea of the, the slipperiness of truth right there, um, is that uh, a lie will get halfway around the world before the truth even gets its shoes on. Um, and actually, it's funny, you know, Twain or whoever it was said that many years ago, um, but there's actually been good research proving this. Um, a study that was done by, by uh, a media lab at MIT actually showed that false information on social media got, um, got uh, retweeted more often than true information. Um, and, and actually, that's, that's a little bit sobering um, to think about. I think there's probably a reason for that, which is false stories are more likely to be the kind of really sort of pithy, wow, that's amazing sort of stuff that makes you want to retweet it. Um, the truth is always maybe a little bit more co- complex or a little bit um, less simplistically interesting than a falsehood. And so uh, the truth is probably less likely to be seem like the sort of thing interesting enough um, to retweet. Um, I do want to distinguish between what we might call deliberate misinformation, and there's a lot of that in wartime, versus uh, what we would call uh, the fog of war. Uh, things that it's unclear what's happened or things get reported and they later turn out not quite to uh, uh, have been uh, true. So, for example, this amazing story that came out a few year, a few days ago um, about these Ukrainian soldiers on this island called Snake Island in the Black Sea over uh, close to bo- uh, Ukraine's border with Romania. And the, the, uh, uh, the story was that the Russian naval ship pulled up and basically said surrender. And the, the Ukrainian uh, sailors on the island responded, or border guards, I think they were, regard- uh, responded with an obscenity, basically saying, mm, um, F you, I think was the, uh, the terminology. Um, and the story was that they had then all been killed for their defiance. Well, apparently now, the story at least out today is that they weren't actually all killed. Um, so was that deliberate misinformation by Ukrainians trying to build up this heroic story of defiance? Or was it just not clear in the, in the, the heat of battle that they actually had survived? I really don't know. But that, that, uh, that, that's where things begin to get blurry. Um, now, there is some good news. It may be getting easier to avoid blatantly false information, deliberately false information, as some of the main Russian sources of false information, such as um, RT, which used to be called Russia Today, and Sputnik, um, are increasingly being banned from social media and from Western broadcast uh, channels. So hopefully there will be a little bit less, again, of the obviously uh, untrue stuff out there. Uh, that being said, it can still be challenging. And, and to put it simply, um, if you're getting your news from Twitter, um, from Facebook, from TikTok, um, it, it is harder to tell because um, there's so much stuff out there that sifting through the truth and the falsity of it becomes difficult. Um, I think it's easier to rely on stuff being true if you go to reliable sources of media what you might call old media institutions. Maybe not quite as exciting, um, but probably more, uh, more reliable 
and you have a better sense of what their biases might be. So where do I get my information from? Um, I get it from a wide variety of sources, but at least, uh, and some of them aren't, uh, some of them are in Ukrainian or Russian, um, but nonetheless, let, let me try to go through some of this. Uh, and a key point to make is it's a lot, of, it's also a lot easier to get good information if you're paying for it. Um, uh, paraphrasing what, what somebody else said, um, if you're not paying for your news, you're not the consumer, you're the product, right? It's your clicks and your views that are actually being sold to somebody else. So you're not even meant to be the customer. You're the product. Um, that being, so, so let me go through a few of these sources, but I also want to recognize that, especially for my students, uh, of, you know, spending extra money on, on good news um, might be, you know, something that's difficult to do. Um, used to be, of course, when I was a college student, there was no free news. You had to buy a newspaper or borrow one from one of your friends or go to the library. Anyhow, the things that I rely on are The Economist, which is a weekly news magazine out of the United Kingdom. Um, it's high quality stuff. It's, um, it's editorial perspective, I would say, is liberal in the European sense, meaning that it's, um, how would I call it? It's uh, free market oriented economically and uh, low government intervention oriented uh, socially. So uh, that's The Economist. And it comes once a week, but it's not cheap. Um, it is definitely not cheap. Um, another one um, I, I actually pay money for is The New York Times, which I would say overall is a shadow of its former quality. But I would also say that in recent years, um, I would say it particularly in dealing with things like this uh, invasion of, of Ukraine and the war, um, it's actually pretty good. Um, this is really, it's something like this where, where an old media news source like the New York Times is at its best. The Washington Post, similar to the New York Times, right, both sort of left of center in the American sense, editorial perspectives, but lots of good coverage around the world from very experienced reporters. If you want a more conservative perspective um, editorially and more business coverage, uh, you know, the, Wash uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal would be the place um, to go. Um, so... If you don't want to pay for things, which I totally get, here are some good free sources that you could just get online. One is The Guardian, which is a newspaper or online newspaper uh, from, from Manchester, well, originally from Manchester, it's now in London, I think, in the UK, um, uh, sort of a left uh, uh, bent in, in, the, in the English sense, Affiliate, uh, you know, sort of tends to support the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, but their coverage on Ukraine is uh, fantastic. Um, they've, uh, in particular, a reporter named Luke Harding has a lot of experience in Ukraine. Um, if I were going to follow somebody on Twitter, um, Luke Harding of The Guardian would be one of the people I would follow. Um, the BBC, the good old-fashioned BBC, has a lot of resources all over the world um, and, and is quite reliable. Um, they, uh, due to a need to get some more listeners, have also, I would say, have kind of dumbed things down a little bit, but the quality is still pretty good. Uh, the American political website uh, Politico has a has a European uh, counterpart called Politico Europe, and it's just politicoeu.com. It is also, uh, I would say, quite good. Um, has a particular editorial bent, but nothing, you know, too far one way or the other. And then there's actually the English language website of the German state media company Deutsche Welle, um, and it's just dw.com. Uh, lots of good stuff that you can read, some stuff you can watch and listen to in English. It's very good. If you're more interested in listening and watching rather than reading, um, there are some pretty good things as well. In the United States, National Public Radio on radio and its television counterpart, PBS, again, very high quality stuff, tends to skew a little bit left, um, but nothing that I would think is outrageous. Again, the BBC is quite good and has a ton of content, cultural as well as political. Um, and in Canada, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, the CBC, um, has produced, I think, some excellent, excellent reporting on Ukraine. Um, as far as Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and that stuff, um, my advice, simply put, would be uh, to follow people uh, that you've been following over time. And so you've, over a long period of time, maybe built up a, a sense of whether they're reliable or not reliable, as opposed to stuff that you, or sources you just see for the first time, Till you get a better sense of what they are, I probably wouldn't retweet those, and I would just wonder what what, what it's all about. Um, if I really wanted to get my news on Twitter or on any of those sorts of things, what I probably would do is go find 
uh, the reporters from The Guardian or the BBC or NPR who are covering these things and follow them. Um, because those people uh, tend to be reliable and you can identify who they are and who they work for. And to the extent they have biases, which of course we all do, um, you'll have a pretty good sense of, of what they are. Um, so that's my short rundown uh, on, uh, on the media. Um, I'm hoping that some of you are getting some useful information um, and perspective from these videos uh, as well. Uh, and I will be back tomorrow uh, talking about whatever uh, looks to be important tomorrow. Thanks, thanks a lot.